Hi, I'm Taylor Proyle, a graduate student in the Ecology Department at Montana State University. Today, I'll be talking about how my research is attempting to improve native trout conservation in Montana. Native trout are in trouble across North America, cutthroat trout in particular. Out of this one group, which contains about 15 subspecies, several are endangered, some are already extinct, and many, including the Westlip cutthroat trout of Montana, are in severe decline. There are several main drivers of this decline. Habitat degradation and destruction due to mining and logging, overexploitation via angling, and they're incredibly vulnerable to being outcompeted by their non-native cousin, the rainbow trout. Managers in Montana have developed a lot of methods to address these issues, including the use of hatcheries to replace lost populations. When we think of hatcheries, we typically think of their traditional fish farms, which focus on mass producing fish for human consumption. This approach does work for producing lots of fish, but has some problems such as disease and reduced fitness due to the extremely stressful environment. This makes it not appropriate for native trout conservation, where we want the fish to be high quality. Stress responses are a normal and healthy part of life for fish and humans alike. A typical stress response proceeds like this. The fish experiences a stressor, like a predator. This causes the brain to send a signal to the pituitary gland, which then instructs the kidney to begin producing cortisol to send into the bloodstream to mobilize energy reserves, increase the metabolic rate, and generally send that fish into overdrive so that it might escape that predator and stay alive. So this response is good, but as we'll see, if fish are too stressed or stressed too often, it can start to have detrimental effects. Here's a chart to describe what I mean. On the y-axis, we have the degree of response as a percentage, where 100% is just normal function. As the percentage increases, this is when the fish is in a stress response, and cortisol has entered the bloodstream to activate energy reserves. On the x-axis, we have the duration of the stressor. So as the stressor lasts longer, it can affect the magnitude of the stress response. Here's a typical curve representing this relationship. At this duration, there is no negative effect to the fish. It is able to respond to the stressor and recover normally. However, as the stressor persists, the fish is not able to keep up with the energetic demand of the stress response and begins to become sick or lose its appetite. If the stressor continues to persist, the fish will continue to decline in health until it eventually dies. Hatcheries are typically very stressful for fishes, as it can be very stressful for fish to transition from their normal home, typically a tributary of the Flathead River, to a concrete raceway full of stressful new experiences that they've never encountered before. Conservation hatcheries in Montana capture wild trout and rear them in captivity until spawn, taking lots of extra precautions to keep the fish from getting too stressed. While overall this approach works well in restoring lost populations, there is still some evidence that even in this chill environment, it's too stressful for some fish. An analysis I conducted on historical hatchery records revealed that in one group of fish brought to the hatchery, 30% of fish died before they were even able to spawn. And of those fish that successfully spawned, only 23% of the total offspring hatched or were viable. So survival is overall pretty good, but there seems to be an issue with some fish reproducing successfully. So why might this be an issue? Diversity is essential to the health of populations. If certain fish aren't reproducing, they're not passing down their genes and traits to the next generation. Some fish might have better disease tolerance or predator avoidance or better tolerance to drought or high temperatures. And as we don't know which traits might become favorable over time, we have a responsibility to ensure that we're giving all fish a fighting chance in the future. So what could be causing this reduced reproduction? My hypothesis is that trout have different personalities, just like people. A good way to visualize these differences is to picture some trout as jocks and some as nerds. 
And these different types have widely different approaches to life, much like your typical human jocks and nerds. Jocks have a live fast, die hard approach to reproduction. Due to their aggressive nature, they have a higher risk of being eaten, but they're able to get the high reward of the best quality food. They bulk up quickly and are able to mass produce offspring in their first reproduction, which might also be their last because they're much more likely to be eaten by a predator. Nerds take a much more cautious approach. They don't risk being eaten, tending to hide out in the safe cover, but they miss out on the reward of the good food. They don't bulk up quickly, so they produce less offspring, but ultimately have more reproductive events over their entire lifetime than the jocks. So what is the driving mechanism of these differences? With our good friend, the cortisol, the stress hormone. Jocks have low cortisol production, whereas nerds have high cortisol production. So if we think back to that stress response chart I showed earlier, the stress response of jocks is only triggered by high threat stressors and it's not triggered very frequently. While nerd stress response is triggered very frequently and is triggered by very low threat stressors. Cortisol has been shown to reduce reproductive performance. So if we're observing declines of reproductive performance in the hatchery, we could guess that those fish are the nerds. So this indicates that nerds are not reproducing in the hatchery and are therefore not contributing to the next generation of fish. So why should we care about nerds? If jocks are the only type of trout in a stream, there could be devastating effects on a population level as jocks are much more susceptible to predation due to their aggressive nature. Without nerds to mitigate these effects by supplementing these populations, we could see numbers of trout decrease drastically over time. And the goal of these hatcheries is to conserve and promote the full breadth of traits that exist in the wild. We don't know which traits may be beneficial in the future. If hatchery rearing methods are systematically selecting against nerds or any kind of fish, that's not in line with this goal. It could also have severe implications for the future of our wild trout. Just imagine a human world where nerds didn't exist. We wouldn't have many of the technologies that we rely on every day, such as electricity, medicine, or even the iPhone. They'd all be gone. So my hypothesis, which I'm testing through my research, is that the fish that are dying before sexual maturity or not spawning successfully are nerds. The fish that grow the most and do the best in the hatchery are jocks. I also hypothesize that the nerds are identifiable by a suite of traits which correlate to their stress response. Cortisol is very difficult and very expensive to sample, so it's important that we're able to relate this response to some other measurement that's easier to sample in a hatchery setting. To test these hypotheses, my research is tracking one group of fish from when they enter the hatchery all the way until they reproduce. And throughout this time, I'm measuring a bunch of different physical traits, such as behavioral boldness, body shape and morphology, and stress response and other physiological measurements. I will then relate these traits to the fish's success at surviving, growing, and reproducing, so that we could hopefully relate hatchery performance to some physical trait. By doing this, we could eventually be able to identify nerds right when they enter the hatchery, and could implement some alternative rearing strategies for them. So in summary, if we actually want to restore native trout and give them the best chance at surviving in an uncertain future, we must ensure that our methods to save them aren't actually damning them. We need to better understand the best ways to rear them in captivity to ensure that all fish are able to live and reproduce successfully. Hopefully by studying these traits further, we can identify the nerds early on so we can employ alternative rearing strategies to reduce their stress and give them a fighting chance. And with that, I'd like to acknowledge my collaborators at Fish, Wildlife and Parks, specifically the hatchery staff, Scott Relia and James Dunnigan, funding through the Hungry Horse Mitigation Project and the Burhill Lab. And I'd like to specifically thank STEM storytellers for this opportunity. And if anyone's listening and has any questions, you can email them to me here at my personal email, tayproyal at gmail.com. Thank you.